Good afternoon and welcome to today's open lecture at the RHN. We're delighted you could join us. My name is Jess Bales and I work in the events team here at the RHN. Today we will be exploring instrumental assessment of swallowing in complex neurodisability. We're aiming to have 15 minutes of Q&A at the end of the lecture. Please type in your questions to the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. I will now hand you over to today's speakers. Uh, Taryn Morris, who's an advanced specialist speech and language therapist. Becky Potter, who's also an advanced specialist speech and language therapist. And Zoe Gilbertson. Thank you, Jess, for the introductions. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. I will start off by just running through the aims of um, the lecture today. Okay, so um, just to run through our aims today, so the lecture today is um, focused on discussing the two instrumental assessments um, that we use to manage dysphagia here at the RHN, so typically feed and video fluoroscopy, and we are also including some discussion around the use of cough reflex testing um, as something to inform early, thank you, there we go, um, to inform early referrals to instrumental assessments. Um, and we will also be discussing some of the facilitators and barriers to using these assessments in clinical practice. And we hope to share some tips and strategies of ideas to overcome challenges. Hi everyone, sorry, our laptop we were using just ran out of battery. We're just madly plugging things back in because this one can't move and we will get everything up and running. Taryn, would you be all right to come to this one for a moment? Thanks for waiting. So for the technical difficulties, hopefully it's smooth sailing from here. Um, brilliant. So we appreciate that there is a wide range of background and skill um, in the audience today. And we're hoping that um, you might hear a bit of new information. And if not, it might just be a refresher. Um, a lot of the information we will speak about today is based on our experience here at the RHN, which um, is an adult caseload and quite a specialist setting, but hopefully there are some similarities to draw from our work experiences and we hope that there'll be some useful tips and strategies that will translate to different settings as well. So just a bit of background and context to our setting. So the Royal Hospital is um, a hospital that provides care for patients with complex disabilities, which have arisen from profound brain injury. And our service here is divided up into three main streams. So the first stream is our brain injury service, and this has two level one rehabilitation wards, uh, which are more short, short stay admissions from about three to six months. Our second stream is our specialist nursing home. And here we provide long-term care to um, patients with complex neurodisability. And the third stream of service that we provide is to um, our specialist services, and that includes our ventilated unit, Huntington's disease ward. We have a ward for adults with learning disabilities, as well as a neurobehavioral unit. Um, and then looking more specifically at our speech therapy team. So we consist of 11 speech and language therapists and two therapy assistants, and we work across the brain injury service and our continuing care services. Um, looking at the services we offer, so we run a weekly fees clinic for our patients across the hospital, and we also support a monthly ENT clinic. Um, and on occasion, this um, includes assessments 
um, that require fee scoping or perhaps ENT opinion. We do not have video fluoroscopy on site, but we do refer to a hospital in the community and we attend the outpatient clinic. And we also use cough reflex testing widely across our hospital. Um, before we go into the different types of assessments, we just want to give some background to consider the complexity of the caseload that we're working with. And here at the RHN, we see a wide range of neurogenic dysphagia. So both acquired and relating to progressive neurological causes. And there's not really one piece of research out there that gives a concise overview of the prevalence of dysphagia, but we do know from all the different types of research and literature that dysphagia is common in the neurogenic population. And considering the wide range of etiologies and the complexity of our patients at the RHN, we do see a range of multifactorial swallowing difficulties. Um, so if we think about a clinical swallow examination, uh, traditionally, this is associated with starting with the cranial nerve assessment and a bedside swallowing assessment, and from there making recommendations. So you do gain crucial information from a thorough bedside assessment, and you can often make a hypothesis about the swallow. Um, it's obviously an essential part of our dysphagia assessment, however, it does have its limitations. Also, in our caseload here at the RHN, it's often not possible to carry out, for example, a full cranial nerve examination, and at times gathering a thorough case history can be very challenging. There's a lot of evidence out there that suggests a clinical swallow examination has very variable sensitivity, and it's not reliable for detecting silent aspiration as it tends to focus on overt signs of aspiration. So using a cough post swallow as an indicator for aspiration has very limited reliability. There was a study by Daniels et al that found that clinical swallow examination only has 35 to 50 7% sensitivity in detecting aspiration, and the low sensitivity is due to the incidence of silent aspiration. Um, they concluded that if someone is coughing, they are 85 to 89% likely to be aspirators, but if they don't cough, we still don't know. There's also evidence that indicators such as dysphonia and voice changes post-swallow are not fully reliable. There was a study by Splainguard, which is very relevant to our setting. Um, it looked at aspiration in the rehabilitation population and showed that clinical swallow examinations only identified 42% of aspirating patients that were identified instrumentally. And the reason for this was silent aspiration. So there are a number of studies out there which show the prevalence of silent aspiration. And the main take home message I think that we always try to focus on is that we need to consider the consequence of aspiration for our patients. So including others, we need to think about pneumonia, the risk of poor nutrition and hydration, increased length of hospital admission, or in our case, a disruption to their rehabilitation time, as well as increased mortality. And we need to identify aspiration as early as possible and keep in mind how prevalent silent aspiration is in our cohort of patients. So there was a tool that was developed to aid the identification of silent aspiration, and that is cough reflex testing. And I'm not sure if everyone has experience with cough reflex testing, but just a quick summary to run through. So in a cough reflex test, an individual will inhale citric acid through a nebulizer face mask, and their cough response is then observed. If they produce a strong cough, it is suggestive that they would be able to protect their airway should food or drink um, be aspirated. And conversely, a weak or an absent cough um, in response to the citric acid indicates there's impaired sensation and it puts the patient at high risk of silent aspiration. So CRT has actually been used for over 50 years in um, respiratory medicine, and it's been used for approximately 20 years by speech therapists in dysphagia assessments. And CRT is widely used in New Zealand and Australia specifically. However, a study by Trimble in 2020 found that only 8% of respondents in NHS trusts were using CRT, um, but there were quite a few that reported they were considering implementing it in their practice. So when we look at the figures here, um, the sensitivity and specificity of cough reflex testing compared to fees and video fluoroscopy is not ideal. Um, and it's certainly not a perfect tool, um, but it is a quick test. And when you use it in conjunction um, with other information gathered from your cl clinical swallow evaluation, it does help to identify those most at risk for silent aspiration. And it can also provide prompts to therapists to make referrals for instrumental assessments a lot earlier on in their management. 
Something to keep in mind um, when using cough reflex testing is that a past response on a cough reflex test must not be taken as a instrumental or diagnostic test result. And you need to consider this result in conjunction with all of your other assessments and bedside observations. Um, and then just looking at how we use cough reflex testing here at the RHN. So the team have been using it since 2015. And like I said, we use it across all of our services. Um, we recently completed a service evaluation looking at how we use cough reflex testing. And something I've just pulled out from that was looking at contraindications to cough reflex testing. And the main contraindications in our caseload relates to patients not having a dysphagia when they're admitted to us or patients already being on established oral intake at the time of their admission. Uh, patients who have tracheostomies or open stomas would not be candidates for cough reflex testing, as well as patients who are um, in PDOC and lacking awareness. Um, for example, if they are in a very low, uh, maybe VF state, and there are no clear benefits to establishing oral intake. Um, there may also be some infection control measures uh, restricting the use of cough reflex testing, which we found a lot last year because of COVID, as it was an aerosol generating procedure. Um, but from the literature, it appears that cough reflex testing is most commonly used earlier on um, post injury. But here at the RHN, we found it is still very beneficial to use even months after an injury, particularly for patients um, for whom cough reflex testing was um, not appropriate earlier on, uh, perhaps if they had a tracheostomy, which was later weaned, um, as well as for patients who fees or video fluoroscopy are not viable options. Um, and also in our context, considering the high prevalence of silent aspiration, we find that it's a useful tool to add to our swallowing assessments. Um, something else important to remember is when using cough reflex testing, we do need access to instrumental assessments. So if on a CRT um, you find that a patient lacks sensation, we still don't know whether they are aspirating or not. So we only know that they are at risk of aspirating silently. So as with all tools, we suggest that cough reflex testing should not be relied on in isolation for any decision making, but rather to use it as a contribution to other information gathering and assessments and observations that you have made. Um, and I think this will lead us on to our discussion about fees and video fluoroscopy. So I will hand over to Becky to lead the discussion. Thank you, Terry. Um, so the previous slides show us how important it is to have access to instrumental assessments in order to make sure we are identifying the nature of the swallowing difficulty, its severity, and the potential for rehabilitation and um, or co compensation for all our patients. In the next section, um, I'm just going to run through the pros and cons of fees and, and video fluoroscopy and briefly cover research regarding their use. This may well be information that some of you already know. Um, so I, hopefully you just look on it as a refresher. And I think it's important to keep it in mind whenever we're considering further assessments of our patients, just to make sure we're selecting the most appropriate one or even um, being aware of keeping a record of needs in case we're having to advocate for access to, to more instrumental assessments. Um, so just as an introduction to both and also a break from our voices, we found a clip um, of a simultaneous fees and video fluoroscopy that Susan Langmore made probably several years ago because it's a bit grainy. Um, but it's, it's quite useful to see them side by side. And, and just keep an eye on the residue pattern, particularly on the fees, because it's relevant to um, my later slide, um, just in discussions about residue on fees versus video fluoroscopy. So I'll just, hopefully this will work. I don't think there's any sound. Sorry, there's no, there is sound, but it, it's not playing. I think it's they're um, giving the patient apple um, and some milk and then some coated bread and cheese. You can, if you look on the fees there, there's a, 
there's a real coating around the pharynx that um, you don't see on the video fluoroscopy, which I think is interesting. This is the bread and cheese coming. Just going to stop it there. So although video fluoroscopy has always initially been seen as the gold standard of dysphagia assessment, um, there is recognition now that fees and VF have their advantages and disadvantages and, that, and really they're complementary. Um, there's a very recent study uh, this year, it's an open access um, article, which um, looked at 49 patients with simultaneous fees of video fluoroscopy, and they found that both assessments had a really high correlation between penetration, aspiration, and pharyngeal residue. So they concluded that both should equally be, be considered as diagnostic gold standards for dysphagia. Um, there is other research that, um, uh, that varies on which assessment is more sensitive to the detection of aspiration and penetration and residue. So Kelly et al. in 2006 and seven found that penetration and aspiration residue scores were higher in, rated higher in fees than in video fluoroscopy. And this was confirmed later by another study by Pisenia and Langmore in 2016. So we just need to take this into account when analyzing fees that um, to make sure we're not potentially reporting dysphagia is more severe than it is um, if the research indicates that we're identifying more episodes, potentially of penetration and um, aspiration and the amounts of residue. And um, finally, there was one study that followed the outcomes of patients um, over the course of a year after having had a video fluoroscopy or a fee. So they were randomly assigned to one or the other. I think it was 126 patients. Um, and they found no difference in the incidences of pneumonia. So they were just looking at the management of dysphagia and any um, implications this has on, on pneumonia and chest infections. And that was by Aviv in 2000. Uh, so I'm just going to briefly run through the main pros and cons of video fluoroscopy now. So this is not a comprehensive list. Um, it's just a summary of key points and I'm sure there'll be other bits that I potentially have missed. Um, we know that in terms of advantages, we get a really full view of the whole oropharyngeal and the upper esophageal structures and the, the complete swallowing physiology. Uh, we know it's sensitive to detecting penetration, aspiration, residue patterns, volumes and also the clearance of all of these which is really important. Um, we can use it to provide a baseline of swallow function in form therapy and use it to measure change over time. Um, we can use it to trial strategies uh, such as chin tucks, clearing swallows, head turns and if we have access to it afterwards it can also be used to educate families um, and patients. In terms of disadvantages it's not possible to view secretions or the actual laryngopharyngeal anatomy on video fluoroscopy. Um, it obviously exposes patients to a small amount of radiation and this then impacts on the time that we have available to complete the assessment. So um, uh, this means perhaps we're not maybe able to push patients quite as much as we'd like. Um, they, need, they need to be medically stable and to be able to sit in a chair to participate. Um, and finally, using, although you can use, you know, whatever food you want, because you have to put barium on it, it obviously changes the nature of it and potentially causes difficulties with acceptance. Um, I know I've had experience of this. And, and barium in, in itself is just a slightly different um, viscosity and texture to normal fluids. Um, so moving on to fees. 
in terms of advantages, we hopefully get a very clear view of the laryngopharyngeal anatomy as long as uh, nothing's uh, fogged to the scope. Um, we can use secretions really clearly, um, looking at location amount, and again, the ability to clear secretions. So this is really helpful for people who have a severe dysphagia, where you're worried about significant aspiration, and also, you know, and for people with tracheostomies. So it, it gives a view of the pharyngeal stage of the swallow, and it is sensitive to detecting penetration and aspiration. Um, there aren't any time constraints. So as long as the patient can tolerate it and the endoscopist's arm can do it, um, you can keep it going as long as, as you want. So that's really useful in being able to push patients, trial maneuvers, you know, have whole meals. Um, you, you know, when we're using fees, it's, you actually often want people to aspirate so that you can see what happens when they do aspirate because that might be something that's happening regularly you know, outside of the assessment and we want to know how they respond to it. Uh, you can use real food, preferential food, um, fees, you can take it to the patient's location, it can be done in bed, and it's also a really useful tool for biofeedback and education as well. Um, in terms of disadvantages, obviously, while we see the pharyngeal swallow, we miss um, one of the key sections of it. So um, the loss of view during the whiteout, which is reflected light from the pharyngeal tissues. Um, so if you have concerns about aspiration happening during the swallow, then video fluoroscopy is you know, probably a better assessment. Um, you can't view the oral stage, but we can make inferences about it. And again, some aspects of the pharyngeal swallow, we, we have to infer through the residue pattern. So for example, if you saw significant molecular residue, you might hypothesize that there was either reduced base of tongue to pharyngeal approximation or um, inadequate epiglottic deflection. So you'd have to make inferences. Um, and then you might want to compare, um, confirm potentially with the video fluoroscopy um, at a later date. Similarly, with the esophageal stage isn't seen and you can only infer. Again, you might need to confirm with video fluoroscopy and it, it isn't comfortable. So as much as we tell everyone it's not painful, um, it's definitely not a comfortable procedure. So um, some people appear to tolerate it better than others. Um, and we find, although we, you know, we have good success rates with our fees, definitely in caseloads where patients can't communicate or understand necessarily why we're doing it, that can be a challenge. Um, so we know that um, instrumental assessments are really key in being able to help diagnose and manage dysphagia. However, we also recognize that the complex neurogenic caseload is really difficult and very challenging. Um, assessment of swallow is rarely straightforward, we find. Um, there are multiple factors in our ability to complete assessments um, and things that we need to take into account to make them as successful as possible. So I've, this is just a, a, a few examples dotted around the drawing. But our, our patients here often don't have the language or cognitive skills to be able to participate in a cranial nerve exam or understand the, the rationale behind examinations. Um, they may have behaviors in challenge, in which case it's really essential to know them really well and be aware of their body language and facial expressions, what these mean, and have a plan with the MDT. They may have physical impairments, so changes in tone, uh, weakness that affect their ability to feed themselves or even to open their mouths. Um, and this is it just in addition to their general positioning in the bed and chair, maybe suboptimal. Um, we often have patients who are hypersensitive and we need to do work on that before we can even get close to eating and drinking. Um, uh, we see people with a sensory impairment, so they may not be able to see or they may have a visual neglect, hearing may be impaired, or they may have taste changes. Um, and it's just really important to be aware of their medications, the timing that they have them, the environment, how they respond to that, potential fatigue. All these things are really crucial in when you're thinking about um, this major assessment. Uh, so just leading on to that, 
before I hand over to Zoe, um, I've got, uh, I just wanted to share a case study um, where we used all the tools we've talked about today. So cough reflex testing for using video um, in, in the case of a man who had really quite um, complex neurological deficits. Um, in his case, I don't think there is a clear answer and I feel like I've still piecing together bits of the puzzle. However, each assessment was really, gave really valuable information in, um, in helping to establish his dysphagia presentation, how to manage it. So this was a 50 year old man who was admitted to us after a bilateral thalamic infarct that extended to the midbrain. When he came to us, he had really severe cognitive communication impairment. He was severely ataxic, bilateral eyelid apraxia, so he could see, but couldn't open his eyelids. Um, and severe sensory impairments, particularly uh, impaired proprioception and awareness of where he is in space. And he was nil by mouth with a peg. Um, obviously, cr a cranial nerve assessment was difficult. Um, he generally had good range of movement, but things appeared uh, with reduced coordination and he was dysphonic. He passed cough reflex testing with caution. So he did cough, but it was a weak cough. Um, and then on oral trials after he was, there was some inconsistent coughing and throat clearing. So I referred him for a fees assessment. And on this fees assessment, he actually did much better than I thought. Um, and just had one episode of penetration with a large sip of thin fluids, uh, which he coughed to. There was no significant residue, sometimes um, quite a late pharyngeal swallow trigger, but he seemed to be managing. Um, and if I hadn't seen him at bedside, I think we probably would have recommended, you know, him to start eating and drinking um, something regularly with the nursing staff. But because I'd seen him at bedside, I knew he was really variable and I carried on seeing him. And he carried on being really variable and um, coughing regularly, which wasn't reflected in the fees. And so I referred him for video. And video fluoroscopy, we, there were limited trials. Again, because there were slight behavioral issues here, he obviously didn't like the barium, he was grimacing small amounts, and then he spat out the large sip of barium that he had. Um, from what um, we could manage, um, he was diagnosed with a moderate oropharyngeal motor and sensory dysphagia with oral issues, um, impaired higher laryngeal excursion, um, and moderate amounts of residue, which hadn't been seen on fees, so that was a bit different. Um, so again, not an easy picture, but combining all those assessments, there's just a few things that we've been working on in his therapy. So that has included joint sessions with OT to facilitate positioning and support for his eating and drinking, continuing to tape his eye open as much as he can tolerate so he can see what he's doing. We can't do dysphagia therapy exercises, um, but so I've been focusing on sensory rehabilitation and using fizzy drinks, sour, cold, hot boluses, uh, with the hypothesis that this may help him um, make his pharyngeal swallow trigger more prompt um, and maybe make him more sensate to the residue that he obviously sometimes has. Um, we try and use preferential food and drink and support with cues, telling him, um, talking about the food and trying to get him to smell it. Um, use strategies, so a teaspoon followed by a coated teaspoon to try and help with residue. And we're just monitoring whether he's better in a particular time of day or um, in a particular environment. There's multiple um, things that we need to think about um, in looking at his management after the, these assessments. But each one was really helpful in just adding another element to his um, dysphagia diagnosis and management. And with that, I will then hand over to Zoe, who's going to give us some more practical tips on what to do. Thank you. OK, so I'm just going to talk through um, some of the problem solving we do um, around our quite complex caseload. There's um, some more recent research that really focuses on how um, positioning can really impact on swallow and we certainly see that in practice. Um, in terms of fees, um, that's great, you can take it to where they are if 
you, some of the chairs we have here are really large. Um, if you're quite small like me, I can highly recommend a step stool to help you get in a good position for your fees. We can also think about in something like video fluoroscopy, where the size of the chair might be um, difficult in the space. The lap trays tend to take up a lot of space, um, arm rests. I talk to the OTs and physios about, um, you know, for those with subluxed shoulders, does it need to be that high? Can we replace it with something for the, um, for the video fluoroscopy? Especially if their shoulder sits high, it can obstruct the view on the video fluoroscopy. So um, I talked to OT and physio about how we reposition that arm lower and across their body to take um, the shoulder out of view. Um, and we've had quite a lot of success with that. Also, head positioning can be real difficulty. What we really need to think about, though, is what is realistic for that patient for the length of time that they're going to be eating and drinking? If they can only maintain that midline central 90 degree angle for a minute, but we're expecting them to do a whole meal, then we would do the assessment in the position they can maintain. And also think about trying out those positions, um, liaising with our OTs, physios um, to problem solve and use our assessment in those positions. And that might include bed as well as chair in the case of fees. In terms of the cognitive changes that we were talking about, certainly using everything we have to our disposal, sensory um, tactile cues, having people they're familiar with present, if that helps to give them reassurance, even if they're not able necessarily to understand the full rationale, having people um, and an environmental setup that they find comforting. Um, we've had a patient for CRT, for example, who was very agnostic and we couldn't bring the food or drink or objects to his face at all. Um, but we were thinking, how much can we really um, push this outside um, of sessions? How confident do we feel for people to try food and drink? Um, and we used a dummy mask so that we could do it with him to help him understand what he needed to do for the assessment and feel reassured. So um, we definitely think around the problem for those that may be reaching for the scope or for the hand of the person feeding them. We might think about giving their hand something else to do. So if they're able to, maybe they can hold the cup with hand over hand support, or we can give them something else sensory to hold, like a, a towel or an apron um, to keep that hand busy and help them focus on the, the swallowing assessment. Um, here, we don't just think about um, the texture of the food and the position, but also what equipment is around to help us. We know about the research that if people are more independent, they may get all that extra information that might reduce their risk of aspiration. So the single dose cups that you can see at the top, less easy to get hold of now, but certainly um, something we use quite a bit around the hospital. Um, the Pat Saunders straws to help those with the effort of sucking up through the straw, nosy cups we use a lot, and those coloured ones at the bottom, the flexi nosies, even deeper cut out for the nose to keep that midline position, and you can squeeze to really help with the lip seal. Um, thinking about bolus size again, we use a lot of maroon spoons here to make a smaller bolus, also help people if um, they have less coordination, not bang into their teeth, which can be quite um, uncomfortable. And the white spoon you see at the bottom there is very flat, really helpful in those that might have minimal mouth opening. They can also be cut and shaped to suit the, in, um, the individual. We normally go to our OTs for a bit of help with that, with the equipment they have in Splint Clinic. Um, so just thinking about what equipment is available and taking it to those objective assessments. So trying it outside of the assessment and then seeing what difference it makes. Um, I know that Becky also spoke about carbonated liquids. I've just put a bit of a reference there. So thinking about the sensory changes we can do in terms of temperature and mouthfeel, taking those to the objective assessment and seeing how that changes it. Really thinking about you know, a puree, are we testing yogurt? Are we testing mashed potato? If we feel that that makes a difference for the patient at bedside, we need to try and take that or replicate that 
in the objective assessment. Um, the difference between milk and water has come up in assessments as well. Barium. Uh, um, so we talked a bit about the fact that barium can change the density and viscosity of the item we're giving. And uh, there's some nice research by Park where they started to standardize the recipes for the IDSI levels. Um, and the survey um, I've put there at the top, Benfield surveyed a lot of staff uh, in the UK about their practices. There was a lot of variation, not a, not a lot of standardization in things like recipes. So it's great that there's some new research coming out for that. The other thing that wasn't so standardized in video fluoroscopy was the frame rate. And when we looked at the gold standardization and comparison of fees to VF in the reliability of identifying aspiration and penetration, there seemed to be um, some researchers showing a significant difference between 30 pulses per second versus 15. Yet in the survey of clinical practice, a majority of people were still at 15 frames per, per second. So we're thinking about in your service or the service you use, um, what are they using? And is there, uh, is, is there a possibility of changing it? Um, also thinking about texture. So uh, there's some more research coming out about the different colors of dye and how that might affect assessment in fees. Um, we've started trialing using some super white and we do find it useful for the opacity, though we are noticing it is more viscous. So thinking about the amount you're using, especially in something like thin liquid and checking we, we're sure we're testing the IDSI level that we think we are. Um, tracheostomy and ventilated patients. This might not be something that you come across in your caseloads a lot or the service you use. For example, we're going out to video fluoroscopy and uh, the clinicians in that clinic may not be as familiar with um, tracheostomy and ventilated patients. And we collaborate a lot over this and um, including if they need, you know, specialist vent support while they're off site, having your ventilator specialist nurse or physio present, checking we have the right suction equipment if we think they require suction as well as the people competent. Um, we've, there's the new research around about above cuff vocalization or above cuff airflow to increase sensation for those um, that cannot tolerate having the cuff down on their tracheostomy. And fees is a great place um, to have a look at that. In fact, that's part of our safety protocol um, to check their tolerance of that before we start it at bedside. And also using the one-way valve protocol to really see the effects of um, cuff changes on their saliva management. So just thinking about how we can use the tools to assist in um, management of saliva as well as um, oral intake. Um, actually, in terms of, yeah, here we go. Um, what if they're aspirating whatever you try? I guess we just wanted to raise the issue that aspiration isn't the only thing we're looking for. We're also looking for um, what do they tolerate better? What are the exercises that might help this person? What might be the least risk in terms of what does the person want? What might be in their best interests? What have they been tolerating so far? Um, can they cough and clear what they do penetrate? Um, or are they a person that has routine cough assist and suction that manages it in the right balance? Um, in terms of how important it is for their quality of life. We are also thinking about the risk mitigation. We've gone through a lot of that. What is there to do with positioning, equipment, time of day, sensory support? What can we change um, or what intervention can we give that might move them towards a safer swallow? And also think about the right time. And that's not a point in their rehab that is so individual. We have the luxury here, of perhaps having people in long-term care where this can be reviewed over longer term. And what we find is sometimes 
after their rehab phase, there might be a time that is more appropriate for these swallow assessments, swallow reviews or swallow techniques that they weren't able to tolerate or engage with before. So really know your patient, know your team, and we really work together to problem solve and think about and review people at different times. Now, obviously, this is a really complex subject and we don't have enough time in an hour to go through everything. So there is an upcoming study day about navigating risk and complexity um, and ethical dilemmas in swallowing and nutrition, which um, if you go onto the RHN website, you can join if you're interested in a bit more um, discussion. Um, we also thought we'd just talk about the future. We've um, been on some courses and seen some new research coming up around swallowing on ultrasound. Though this is definitely not in current practice, our CSLT um, are still reviewing the evidence, although it looks positive, we really don't have the normative data and assessment protocols to be using this in practice, um, something to look out for perhaps in the coming years. In summary, what we wanted to say is uh, dysphagia management and assessment needs to be completely person-centered. If it doesn't work at one time, don't worry, it might work at another another time and maybe in collaboration with your colleagues, um, we can come up with different ideas. We definitely include the MDT and that includes the family um, as we know people might behave quite differently um, with people that they find reassuring. Think about more than just texture and just to acknowledge it's really hard and reach out to your colleagues, the MDT, but also other speech therapists. We're constantly um, looking to our peers and um, discussing cases for ideas. Um, thank you for listening. Now, I think we've had a bit of a team looking at the questions and coming up with some themes. Um, if you still have questions, feel free to put them in the chat box, um, but hopefully most of them have come up. What have we got? There's a question okay. around the patient demographic um, mm. or who we would use cough reflex testing with at the RHN. So mm. um, we use cough reflex testing across our services. So we do use it with um, our MCS patients, so in minimally conscious states, uh, patients with cognitive communication difficulties, although to keep in mind that sometimes um, depending on um, how aware your patient is of, um, you know, that perhaps it's not the most comfortable uh, procedure. Uh, they might be holding their breath. That has happened before. Um, and we also use it with our rehabilitation patients. Um, so someone's asked, would we, would we repeat it for outcome measures? I mean, it's not a routine repeated measure, but we wouldn't rule it out. If we think someone might have significantly changed in their presentation um, and we believe that their, their sensation has changed, um, we certainly could. Um, so there's a question about fees in PDOC. What are the outcomes and indications, including Tracheostomy. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so we do we do, do fees in PDOC quite regularly. Um, I, I'd say largely probably uh, in use it particularly in terms of tracheostomy and weaning from tracheostomy yeah. and looking at saliva management. So we have a, a, a probably about half our referrals coming into the fees clinic are for saliva management. Um, and generally for people with a tracheostomy. Um, I think potentially also we would do fees looking at oral intake if you're not the yeah. person. Yeah, be because very... we, we want to think about quality of life mm. outcomes. And remember, oral intake can be a real social element as well. And thinking about the family, um, I'm sure those of you that have read updates to the PDOC guidelines, um, there's more information there. But thinking about, does it benefit them to have oral intake and um, what is the risk associated with it? Um, so yeah, if people can engage with the oral intake, it would be relevant, yeah. Um, we've got a question here about Pat Saunders straws. Um, so it's definitely something to be assessed by um, a speech therapist because not everyone can tolerate using a straw. It does decrease the energy use slightly. I mean, the liquid does come back down the straw eventually. Um, but it can hold it there a little bit longer um, for people sipping um, 
So, for example, I would say in um, some of our progressive degenerative, that can be a really helpful step. Um, do um, sorry, we're just checking more questions. Which which assessments? Oh, for Huntington's disease. Um, all of the above. Yeah, everything we've discussed today, I would say is a, across the board. It's definitely not about what condition a person presents with, but what the individual presents like and what their needs are to pick the appropriate assessment. Um, there was a question about um, which other professionals would need to be involved to setting up um, using cough reflex testing. So you would need a doctor to prescribe the citric acid and also a pharmacy um, who orders the citric acid and you then obtain the citric acid from them, which can sometimes take time. Mm -hmm. uh, we also got set up on the system in terms of signing off as the person who'd given the citric acid. So that might be something if you're setting up in the service you want to consider. Any experiences using phagenics for disabled dysphagia treatments for the pharyngeal stimulation. stimulation no <laughs> <laughs> short yeah, but similar, yeah go on amy um, I'm, I'm one of the leads here i'd be really interested to know if anybody is using it because i need to be um try to find out a bit more about it and it's quite expensive i think mm. and it's hard for us to we have to get it in on a patient by patient basis at the cost of a couple of thousand pounds per patient and I think the research, the evidence is still coming through. So if anyone is using it and wants to let us know, we would love to know because it is something, particularly with some of our more cognitively impaired patients, if it's something they can do a little bit more passively, we would be really interested in exploring and trying. Mm -hmm. um, okay, somebody here has asked about if we always use fizzy drinks at bedside. Um, I wouldn't say always. Um, if we believe that sensory stimulation would help, we have if we can purchase fizzy drinks and we have an ice chip maker. So um, again, it's on an individual basis. Um, another thing is obviously a family have said they have a particular favorite and we think it might be a motivational tool. Um, it's always good to go with something motivating in uh, dysphagia rehab. There's a very quick question about um food modification and do we use IBSI, mm -hmm. which we do. Yes, Just. yeah, we do. How would PDOC patients have oral intake for fees? Well, I think that depends um, where on that continuum they are in PDOC, but I definitely refer you to the updated RCP guidelines for PDOC, or if you have a particular um, individual in mind that you wanted to discuss through, you could always um, drop us an email and we can discuss um, an individual case. Do we use iQuaro? I did look into some of the research on that. Um, I haven't used it, but did look at it and consider it. Does anyone else? Well, I've been similarly the IOP as well. I haven't used it, but have looked into it because I, I think some of the patients we get here, they're so impaired mm -hmm. that, you, you know, often perhaps if, if the evidence isn't, really strong but you're still looking for things that you can try with people because you know you've got such limitations in terms of what mm -hmm. you can do so we we haven't but uh would be very interested in hearing yeah. from someone that has yes if anyone else has got a success story we'd be really interested to hear about it um i think that's true of our whole team really we're always really interested in hearing about what other options are out there that might um be helpful um, and looking for the new evidence. Uh, Amy, are there any other questions so coming in? What, um, someone has asked what cough assist is. Um, cough assist is a physio tool which helps somebody to get a good, strong cough. Um, and I think it's a, it's a passive thing which is used to help clear a chest. It's not mm -hmm. actually a rehab tool. So if you need to know a bit more about that, probably grab your physio colleagues. And mm -hmm. um, thank you to Helen and Jenny who do use vaginics. What outcome measurement tools do we use for bedside assessment? We use, mm. we use our UK rock ones. Yeah. We, use, we, we have to use UK rock ones. So we, um, we unfortunately, we're using the FinFam mm. um, and then Northwood Park. Yeah. Mm. 
we don't specifically because we're having to do all of those we don't spend a lot of time doing other outcome measures no um, i would say individual more like yeah. your there is a lovely question here oh yeah about well there's two anyone use semg yes, yes. We do. and have we ever used via zoom yes, yes we, we use that quite a lot now i would say um, we use via Zoom both for quality of life, so those that are unsafe for oral intake and can't tolerate it, but get pleasure from the, the taste, um, including handing it over to families. We were talking about that social side of sharing um, tastes, so we use via Zoom for that. But also in terms of we swallow rehab and the motivation of having a spoon of flavour to get those swallows going um, in people that really can't tolerate. Um, I know sometimes it can cause a lot of excess saliva that people don't manage, but I would say it's in the far minority of those that I've tried it with. Um, yeah. So to follow the question I asked a bit earlier about somebody wanting um, uh, uh, assessment of fees in the community for a patient in bed. Now, the latest RCSLT position paper on fees did have a section on extending fees in the community. So I would suggest having a look at that because obviously that's a much bigger deal because the original position papers for fees says that really you need to be on a site where you've got medical backup, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. I think it is extending, but you would need to you would need to look. That's not within our experience, I'm afraid. So it's caught you with that. Mm. Um, Can we repeat what outcome measures? Yep, yeah, we use the FIMFAM and the Northwick Park Therapy Outcome yeah. Measures. But also um, patients' individual goals based on their quality of life. Um, so if someone wants to work towards or shows interest in oral intake, then it would be um, their individual goals like gas goal setting. Yeah. I'll just drag up, so we've talked a bit about fees and PDOPs, and drag up, we're going to be doing a study day. Oh, um, uh, yeah. Do you want to, when's your study yeah, day? So we, we've had a few questions about fees and, and PDOP. So just to flag up that it's quite interesting in PDOP because there's a there's obviously that consideration of where are you going with oral intake? Are, is somebody aiming for, is it for nutrition? Is it for assessment of awareness and interaction? Um, so we're actually going to run a whole study day in the spring, I think, coming into April on oral intake in PDOP patients. So if anybody's interested, join us for that. And I think we've got another day in December. Yeah, so the EPIC study day, uh, we did have it on the site. Maybe I can go back to it, actually. Uh, there we go. So there's one on uh, navigating risk, complexity and ethical dilemmas in swallowing and nutrition. Um, so, um, yeah, I, uh, it's definitely an MDT approach, so and um, mm -hmm. open for discussion. And, and before we close, I've just seen a question that somebody put in the chat about using SEMG. Yes, it's a bit of a hot topic. I'm going to yeah. see if Becky will Should I off. turn it around? Here we go. Um, so we, we do use SEMG, but we are also, at the minute, actively trying to find other people that use it because we have some we have some difficulties with setup and just in general yeah. how to use it functionally with patients. So um, mm. if you are, well, if you have great success in using SEMG, then we would love to hear from you. Um, if you're equally, if you're if you're trying to set it up and you're struggling a bit, we'd also quite we'd be happy to link up. So we just mm. yeah, yeah. So we have got biscuit software but have struggled. So we've tried use it. just using the neuro track. Yeah. Um, trying different positioning. Um, we, we yeah, I think that it would be a great topic for a study day. If mm. Anyone wants to run away. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> especially if someone's having more success. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I think uh, we will close it there. Thanks everyone for listening, um, and I guess get in touch via the RHN website um, if you would like. Thank you.